Wonderful. So my name is Brian Knight, one of the co-founders of the Afro-Caribbean Business Network and a board member of SETSI, the social economy through social inclusion. I am proud to be facilitating this panel, Banking While Black. As you know, there's uh, the Black Entrepreneurship Program that the federal government created that is designed to address the systemic barriers that we do face as we bank while Black, uh, we do have to put a lot of pressure on the banking institutions to make sure that it is inclusive, but we also have to increase our quality so that when we do get the door open and we do get to walk in, that we are ready to execute. So organizations like myself or ACBN, we are designed to help you elevate that bar, but I'm glad to be able to facilitate this conversation with wonderful colleagues such as Susan Henry, uh, Kavant Edwards, uh, Tiffany Callender, and I apologize. I'm... Oh, and Yomi, sorry, Yomi from uh, BMO. So just before we jump in, I do want to make sure that we do open up the session by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we are on. We also acknowledge our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or com compensation. We acknowledge all the elders and community st stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for the collective liberation and sovereignty of our community. We have a remarkable panel today, as I mentioned. So I'll let them introduce themselves quickly. I'll start with uh, Susan Henry from Alterna Savings and Credit Union. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Ryan, and thanks, Victor, for organizing this. My name is Susan Henry, and I'm the Director of Community Impact and Financial Inclusion with Alternative Savings. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Kevon Edwards from CIBC. Hello, hello, Ryan. Thank you for having me here on this panel. Really appreciate everyone, esteemed speakers, and all of the guests. Uh, for CIBC, I lead for our Black client segment and work directly with our Black Entrepreneur Program. So happy to be here and share and to hopefully, you know, answer any questions or concerns. Much appreciated. And I do believe Tiffany is running a bit behind, but Yomi, if you're able to introduce yourself on the panel. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Yomi Atobatele. I manage the Black Entrepreneur Program at BMO. Um, it's a pleasure to be connecting with everyone and I look forward to an insightful conversation. Thanks. Much appreciated. And admin team, you can let me know when Tiffany does uh, join. But to start the conversation, and Susan, I'll start with you. What are the most promising models in racial equity in banking practices that you've seen here thus far in Canada? Great, great question. Um, like, first, I need to say we have to not look at the models first, but look at the organizations that have these models and, you know, what are their values and their mission? Um, and so for us, the at Alterna, our values are the ones that sort of lead us into our microfinance program. But, you know, when I look at those values, for example, they're centered around collaboration, where, you know, we believe the power of team and mindset. And that means not acting alone, but acting in silo, acting uh, within our communities where we could collaborate with community leaders, researchers, and such. Uh, the second piece for us would be around integrity. Um, you know, doing the right thing, <laughs> um, but not always looking for those accolades. Sometimes no one knows what we're doing in terms of, um, you know, we're not doing it to be out there. We're doing it because it's making a real impact, real difference in the communities. And last respect, where we re embrace uh, our differences. And so these are the values that sort of is embedded in uh, our model, which is the community microfinance program. It's a model that's been around for 20 years, addressing socioeconomic inequalities while providing access to capital for underserved communities. And when I look at our program, um, there are some strategic elements that we've, um, that we've been able to learn along the way. And those elements are things like um, providing wraparound supports for individuals, uh, which is particularly important, but doing it in a way where, um, you know, the long-term approach is around success to financial independence. And also looking at our work, not merely as 
administering loan programs, but really being part of community economic development. And, you know, as a result of that, you know, when we're part of the community and we're sort of collaborating together, we're going to see that, you know, we're part of building financial resiliencies. Wonderful. And I'm curious if Kevin or Yomi, Kevin, I'll start with you. Did you want to add to uh, some of the promising bank practices that you've seen as working with CIBC? Definitely. Um, I think Suzanne summed it up very nicely. Um, but but adding to that, it is this, this entire movement of having Black entrepreneur programs being, you know, led by the government and financial institutions stepping in that light and, and working with it. For me, working at CIBC, one of the things that I have identified as far as a model is, is learning. Like the bank is the bank and it's been the bank for how many years before we were doing this, right? And it took a lot to start putting feet on the path of change. And as we walk that path of change, the institution has to be willing to listen and learn. And, and that listening and learning comes on both sides because we as a people are teaching, but we're also learning because there's now information and communication that was not there before. And so long as we keep those lines of communication open and build the relationships that frankly, don't exist right now, we, we are building them. And I am the first person to admit that we need to continue working on them and, and actively pursuing them. Um, that is the model that will work. Like I, I look at the space that we're in and many financial institutions are doing different things in that space. And, and I love it. I love seeing everybody identifying how they can participate and all of the different organizations that are participating, you know, creating, different paths, you know, towards the same goal. And I love that uh, as ACBN has been working with CIBC for over, over a year now, and when we have our conversations, we're able to see the progress, even though it's like pulling teeth sometimes <laughs> because you're dealing with bureaucracy and I can definitely uh, understand that, but we do see progress. And that's why I appreciate the work that you're doing there. And Yomi, did you want to kind of add to the best practices that you're seeing with uh, the BMO Bank you went? Yeah, I mean, like you said, um, the progress, like for me, I think this is a journey, The we're not, um, um, we're not expecting an immediate um, outcome, you know, a better outcome. Because I'll just tell folks that this is a community, this issues have been um, entrenched for you know, decades, centuries, and this has become a generational issue. Um, the good thing about what we're doing is that we continue to um, get more insights into um, what is going on. We're not assuming there is no cliche anymore. We have, um, we're now having good understanding of what those problems are, how, what are the causality factors of all these issues, and. I think the next level is finding those targeted solutions to um, those issues. Because I feel our journey, even in, in the community, our journey is different. Our background is different. Our problems are different. and But we still come together under this umbrella of um, unconscious bias, racism in the system, you know. So there is no one solution that fits all. It's just for us to understand the need that we need to start paying closer attention and understanding those issues as they come. And on our program at BMO, what we try to do is we continue to find those customized solutions, you know, and that's why we've gone beyond. We have a we have a, a, a strategy called the Beyond Learning Program, where we're dealing with um, those businesses as they come forth. We also understand that it's not just about funding. It's also about the business activities. Who is buying from black businesses? How are black businesses able to compete in the society? Do they have the capacity to do so? How is the top line growing? Those are the questions we're asking right now. So we can give you money, which we want to do, but the question is that can you compete? Can you soar with other, other businesses in different communities? Yep. Wonderful. And I appreciate you kind of giving the lived experience of our community 
uh, in the context of your answer. And as a person that is not part of the banking system, but I am an individual that banks while Black. So I'm curious, Susan, you've been at Alterna making sure that community investments is really important. And I do want to get your title right, because I know you've been elevated as a VP, a Vice President of Community Investments. Is that right? So is that for me, Ryan? Yeah, that's your title. The director Alterna. of Community Impact and Financial Inclusion. Excellent, director. <laughs> so thank you for um, being that person in the bank that is really fighting through the governance. So I'm curious, what have you seen in your years of working at Alterna, how the governance have changed to allow for more inclusive banking practices? Yeah, I mean, I think as a financial institution that we have the ability and responsibility that we have to come to our practice from an inclusive perspective. And that's around creating real tools and solutions that sort of that works with historically economic gaps that our community face, right? And these are some of the things that we do uh, at Alterna to improve uh, the lives of our, our members. And again, as a credit union, um, you know, our profits have a higher purpose. Right. So it's, it's really meant to ensure that we are making a difference. Um, some examples that I want to use on, you know, what I mean by some of what I'm saying is when we develop inclusive programs, it's um, particularly around the Black community, is ensuring that the Black community does have a seat at the table when these programs are being um, developed. Um, right. Tiffany's not here, but, you know, I would look at FACE, the Federation of African Canadian Economics, and participation in the Black Entrepreneurship Loan Program by the federal government as an example of getting it right in the community because we had FACE and we had other nonprofits when that was being created to ensure that, you know, those tools were correct and that that access to capital would be available. So that to me was really important. For us, from the alternate perspective, we come to the table as a financial institution as someone that has the experience being provided, given that we've been providing to underserved communities for over 20 years within our microfinance program, we were able to bring our expertise and experience to that table, which is really important, right? But to understand that, you know, we're not there to take over that conversation that the advocates and creators are the black community. And as such, we're community, we're organizations such as FACE. So, you know, if, when we talk about breaking down these barriers, um, I also believe it only happened when you also have those with lived experience, we heard that as well, at the table who are present and community leaders uh, who are there to um, advocate to ensure that government and institutions understand the type of products that needs to be developed in order to move communities forward. So, I mean, I think the last thing I would say on that is that we, we've got to take time to understand what is happening with our communities. Um, it's important to understand the challenges, the barriers that are facing, as well as the success and experiences that's happening on that end. And once we know all that, then we have the ability to sort of to create the support tools and resources that's necessary. And these are some of, you know, what we play in at Alterna. Appreciate that. And Kavan, if you wanted to touch on the time that you've been with CIBC, how has it been, uh, I guess, navigating the governance as you're bringing together these more positive banking models? Yeah, so, um, well, Ryan, you would know we talk fairly often that, you know, it, it, there's a lot of bureaucracy doing anything within a bank. And, and naturally, because of the fiscal responsibilities, etc., there's a lot that needs to be covered off before we make even the smallest change. But recently, with, with, with this program that we've been administering at CIBC, I have seen a definite change in the <clears throat> understanding of the need for change, if that makes sense. As, as, we, as we embark on this program and, and we work with different leaders across the bank, 
the support that we're getting to make those changes is significant and, and it's important, right? Having the right stakeholders involved and making sure that the governance changes are not simply for this program, they are for the future, right? We don't just want a change right now and, and, and you know, it, it's short lived, but we wanna make sure that as we make changes, there are changes that are sustainable um that can inform future changes right like it's not turning around on a dime but we're turning a whole system that has been built with certain things that you know people never considered before something as simple as the criteria by which things are assessed and and the the um like Stats Canada, for example, we'll utilize information from Stats Canada to, to assess something. But if information isn't filtering into Stats Canada from our community, Stats Canada doesn't represent us. So where do we get the information that does represent our community? And that takes conversations. It takes understanding that, okay, we are operating somewhat outside of the regular comfort zone, and and that's part of governance right getting people to buy in, in 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 a room where everybody is thinking okay what is the risk what are the numbers what are the hard requirements implementing conversations as part of that governance model which allows us to present a voice not just a piece of paper with somebody's attempt to you know the bank i need funding but instead Kivan, this is my business. This is what it's done. This is my history. And me being able to go back and have that conversation with our teams is something that didn't exist before. And introducing it as part of that governance has been a massive change. Like my lived experience, as I talk about it and think about it over the last year, some of the progressive conversations that we've had uh, within the bank are really exciting because now I'm looking forward, like if we've had those conversations already, what's the next conversation, right? And, and with success, we will bring more success because now we could point to, after having that conversation, we were able to support this person and look at what they have done. Mm. We should be able to translate that to someone else and someone else. And it becomes, uh, someone said to me, every, every drop in the ocean is just a drop. But at the end of the day, collectively, it's an ocean. So as we fill each drop in that governance puzzle to help it expand, to support the community, we'll eventually get to where we're going, but one drop at a time. Yes, yes. And one thing that you mentioned when we've had our conversations is when I do start to feel like there's a lot of pushback to actually point it out to the person I'm talking to, to the underwriter, because they might not even realize the baked in systemic racism and when you mentioned it, it reminded me that Susan had also told me this to say, when you're feeling um, barriers being put up as you're dealing with the bank, point it out. Don't keep quiet. And I would love to get Yomi your context around the time. And when we talked, you've had a very the career in finance. And so now as you're working with BMO, how has it been uh, navigating the governance to uh, improve their racial inclusion? I mean, we we we've been lucky at BMO because um, um, the, the before our sister bank BMO UR started this program two years before us, so um, we're not just reinventing the wheel. You know, we're just looking at you know the the, the success um, at BMO US, where they are tremendous success, working through the brand channels, and um, we just like have conversation with them, understood the challenges that um, they faced while setting up the program. But but the the Black Entrepreneur Program on the BMO was set up under our overall um, bank objective of um, zero barrier to inclusion, which is um, a strategy where the bank is looking at how best can we work on our ESG objectives, our DEI objectives, and um, the Black Entrepreneur Program is just a piece of that. But the conscious, the consciousness and um, intention of senior leaders, you know, about the program is very critical. Um, we do have meetings with um, not just um, the senior leaders, but also the risk, the risk um, management to continue to understand the community, continue to understand 
um, how things are going, what is um, what is our risk rating looking like? How best can we make the program even better for um, the community? Because um, while we're doing this, is also be mindful of the fact that um, this is money we're giving out, and we just want the best for everyone who's going to use the money. I always tell folks that it is better. It is better we give you. We want to meet you. We want to leave you better than where we met you. Mm-hmm. It, it will be unfair on us as a corporate social organization to um, avail you money and then you're going bankrupt like next three or four years because of the fact that you cannot repay. So that's why for me, um, it's a journey. Let us understand what are those things going on in your personal finance, which is the bedrock for everything how well how disciplined are you and you regarding your personal finance and that's why our risk management model has been drawn not just for black entrepreneurship but also about personal finance you know um our is focusing more also on the black customer segment to find out how best can we make um our black customer ready to borrow from financial institution Uh, But overall, I think we're conscious, we are intentional about, um, about, um, you know, making the the, the situation better. And I think lastly is that it's easy for us to escalate issues to senior leaders, you know, and also um, to those that make critical role, uh, that play critical role regarding, um, you know, um, underserved communities. And I think that's the big strategy and advantage that we get here at BMO. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I know that the the fight internally to change the government's models at any bank is difficult. And Susan, we've had conversations about making sure to not let it affect you to uh, uh, not too negatively on your mental wellness. And so A lot of colleagues we've talked about, rest is resistance. So Susan, I'll start with you. What do you do to really make sure that your self-care is kept up as you're engaged in this uh, everyday battle for inclusion and diversity at the bank? Yeah, uh, great question again, and I could give you the politically correct answer, (laughs) but but there's a lot of work to be done, right? And so I I know many of us in this uh, sector we are on overdrive to ensure that that work is being done. And for me, my work is a passion of love. Um, You know, I came into this because I came from an entrepreneurial background. I understood the challenges in getting financing. So particularly um, as a black woman and underserved underrepresented individual. And so, you know, it was important for me to sort of pick up this torch and do the work that I am doing. I'm fortunate to be at an organization who already had the values and understand, but self-care is very important. You know, your your mental ability to continue, um, you need to be sharp (laughs) in order to continue to get things done. And this is not something that I say just for myself, but I I tell all those who are in our programs and, you know, we hold a lot of workshops around mental health, um, which is important. But, you know, I believe I've I've got this Kobe Bryant mentality, the Mamba spirit that, um, you know, you, you do have to be in overdrive at some point when you want to achieve, you know, I, I, I look at all the work that yourself, Ryan and, and Victor is doing. I don't know if you guys get any sleep, but you know, these things wouldn't be possible if you weren't, um, you know, going 100% beyond what is necessary in order to ensure that our communities have the resources that they need in order to, you know, get the empowerment and independence that is necessary. So, you know, again, I can only say self, you know, I I do a lot of walks and that helps, you know, I I walk my dog and I get my exercise in and that helps, but, um, you know, the work has to continue. So that's also an important factor for me in continuing that. And that's what we love to see when people are on the ground doing the work as you have been when organizations like myself with ACBN or with SETSI see that kind of work being done it makes it so easy to rally behind that and say like, how can we amplify what something like Susan with Alterna is doing? But now 
Kevin, I wanted to shift gears a bit when we're talking about best practices and tools and models. What are you seeing are those generally, what practices are you seeing generally advance justice as we're dealing with in, uh, diversity and inclusion in the banks and as you're having these conversations? So the, to me, the best practice has been openness and transparency. If there needs to be a conversation about something happening, it has to happen and it has to be able to be escalated and dealt with in a very straightforward manner. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't benefit anybody to just smother a conversation. Um, just uh, earlier this month, we, we had uh, some feedback from a client. Um, they reached out and then we were able to reach out and, and, and have a conversation with them, right? Like, and, and help them to understand the perspective and understand their perspective as well. And I think it goes back to that communication piece, that open communication and addressing things and, and just being able to, to work forward from the point that we're at. We have to recognize that forward is the way that we're all trying to go. What is the best way to get there? And, and always work towards having that as your, I guess, North Star, the thing that you're always stepping towards. Um, uh, now, given the role that I'm in, I do get a lot of those, like if somebody goes into a branch and they have a negative experience, it may come to me um, reaching out to people and, and hearing what that experience is and asking, how can we change that experience? How can we make it right? You know, and, and, and trying to live by that mantra, let's make it right. Let's make sure that things work out for you and that you know we learn from it so that nobody else experiences what you experienced or what you felt because sometimes yeah. people are just simply not even aware of how what is transpiring is making someone else feel and communication Absolutely. is the only way we're gonna do that and it has to be that respectful communication where we're able to you know transfer the ideas and let others know exactly what's happening and you mentioned now that uh, if people have an adverse uh, experience, it comes to you. And I know I've like filled your ears with some of my complaints, but being the person that now the negative experiences are coming to you. And I didn't ask you about the self-care and I'd be curious, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Because you're now, you know, that barrier between the bank and those that are banking while black. Well, and I remember I'll, I'll, you took a, a vacation, so I know it was getting to you. You're like, I have to get out of here. <laughs> I'll, I'll adjust one word um, that you said, <laughs> barrier. I'd say more of a hub, right? Because it comes in on, on multiple sides operating in this space, right? You know, right. You're, you're, you're dealing with clients and trying to maintain the relationship there. And you're also trying to change internally and you know, that's not something that is just happening organically. There is a fight on both sides trying to make that happen. So my form of self-care is really at 5.30, I have an alarm set. It goes off. Whatever I'm doing, I try to wrap it up. At 5.40, I go and I work out. I take my workout. And then after my workout, I, yeah, have a shower. If I need to hop back on for some work, I hop back on. But I always make sure to spend the time doing the things that matter. And as I say, the things that matter, my nephew just got home and he's shouting, hello, I hope it's not coming through too loud on the mic, but you know, no, spending you time with family and friends is also really important. And getting out into the community, taking part in community events, seeing the work that we're doing, right? Like I can't just stay in the bank, I have to go out see the people who are putting these businesses in place and, and what they are doing and you know recognizing the work being done is, is all part of it right getting out to events like um first fridays last week you know was on there yes, Sorry. yes. but yeah i'll i'll pass the mic and not take too much um, no worries yeah and okay. i wanted to also get yomi your thoughts on for yourself now you're like the face at BMO for the Black Entrepreneurship Loan Program. So people are gonna come to you with their complaints and their experiences. So how's it been for you with taking care of yourself to make sure that you're optimal as you're doing your job? I think you, for me, I'll say I have to be full before I can you know, share. 
you know so and i think the critical thing i mean i, I came into those taking taking care of this from a product perspective of i've been more in um you know developing products and stuff so moving into this role um one thing i've learned is um you know time management is very important you know because on the average i I have calls every day. I have meetings every day. And like the last speaker said, um, we are more like the middle guy. We're dealing with the community and we're also dealing with the issues in the bank, you know, trying also to work with stakeholders on both sides, you know, um, even our branch channels, you know, um, skill building with the branches, having conversation with them, getting them prepared, you know, for our black customers. It takes a lot, but like I said, it's just um, the fact that you manage your time properly and then also engage in having conversation with even key stakeholders in the ecosystem. I try as much as possible, especially when I'm drained. So like touch base, what is going on? What is this? What is, why are we having these challenges? I saw that I am not having it in my head. I want to make sure that I'm not isolated with these challenges. Um, it's something that um, that keeps me going. I think a lot of collaboration and the con as, an, as we continue to strengthen the ecosystem, it makes players in the ecosystem even stronger to be able to deal with the challenges that is facing the community. But like I said, it's just the fact that you first, when you are good, others mm -hmm. will be and that's how I always operate. Right, it's kind of like the uh, instructions on the plane. If the mask drop down, get it on yourself first before yeah. helping anybody else. So as I rotate back to Susan, and in terms of justice, access, equity, inclusion, and diversity work, I'm curious if there's any frameworks or individuals that inspire you that uh, that you're oh yeah, that inspire individuals that inspire you. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that I was an entrepreneur. I understood the challenges of looking for financing. Um, you know, the one person I researched when I was looking at um, financing was um, the work of the 2006 Nobel Peace Laureate, Professor Mohammed Yunus. Okay. And he's someone who established the Grameen Bank um, in Bangladesh in the early 1980s. Um, he's someone who was a social entrepreneur, activist, banker, economist. Um, but he had this one belief that credit was a fundamental human right. Um, and it was because of that that he sort of came up with innovative financial solutions to help poor women thrive. Um, I'm not saying that he was the founder of microfinance because microfinance can put its roots back to Africa long ago for, for a very long time. But I do believe that the program or, or the, the framework that he developed is something that our program has been modeled after for you know the, the last 22 years. And um, it's that program that I think has the strong principles of equity and equality, um, particularly for those that are underserved. And so for me, he's someone that I, I, I follow him. I've got his books. I, I look at his work and um, the work I'm doing and the work that Altern is doing is definitely model after that in terms of now helping other uh, communities who are underserved. Wonderful. And same question for you, Kavan. Uh, are there individuals or frameworks that, not frameworks, I say, yeah, frameworks or individuals that inspire you based on the work that you're in now? I mean, like, I, I tend to draw my inspiration, I guess, from more so the, the individuals who are putting in the work right now. Um, before I took this, this role with the bank, I was actually trying to help a friend who's an entrepreneur as well, open up their own business and, and you know, in just doing that, you're able to see a lot of what people go through in doing it. Um, myself as an entrepreneur, before taking a permanent role with the bank, I think based on what I was doing, it was somewhat of a easy process. But once, oh, I, sorry, one second.
Oh, yeah, no sweat. <laughs> I know the feeling. Sorry about that. Sorry it's about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like looking at all that entrepreneurs go through and, and seeing some of the things that they have to do is continually inspiring to see, you know, folks go from idea to success. Um, there are those who have influence, like locally, I look at Wes Hall, who has built himself up, most recently got to hear his story of where life started to where he is now. And, and I mean, things like that are a constant inspiration for, you know, even myself as an immigrant coming from a Caribbean country and, and trying to build and establish myself, I have to recognize those who have done it before and, and my role for those who will do it after as well. And, and leaving the door a little more open than I found it is part of it. So, you know, trying to envision myself as one of the leaders who have done it before really helps to drive that. Wonderful. And yeah, Yomi, if you wanted to jump in as well. Um, I think for me, it's just like I I mean, I'm an immigrant also. I'm originally from Nigeria, where the entrepreneur spirit is crazy. You know, you're just on the street of Lagos. Everybody is like in one form of, you know, business or the other. So um, I grew up in that space one. And then for me, it's everyday people, you know, I don't, you don't have to have all the accolades, you don't have to have all the um, the, all the five stars before um, you become inspirational to me. I think it's just um, it's just the fact that you wake up in the morning, you have somewhere you're going, and you're using the um, you know your business to take care of your family, to take care of you know the community. How best can this community also give back for the effort you're making? These are how I see how I see these things. I feel like it's quite important that as we continue as an entrepreneur to give to the community, we should have a support from the community to that entrepreneur. So um, each day I hear those stories, each day I get these calls, I am strengthened and motivated again, because I'm just like, we're almost there. You can get this money, we're just 80% there. How can we move you plus 20% to get you going? So that's why for me, it's, it's more like a journey, you know? I feel like each customer or each entrepreneur I come in contact with, um, it's a story and it's also a journey on how we can work together, how we can be a coach with a uh, coach in your corner um, to assist. And these are the pieces and elements I take with me that motivates me every day. You know, it's just the everyday people, the everyday entrepreneur that make things happen. I yeah, appreciate that. And as it is Black History Month, so in the terms of Black Canadians, I'm curious if we continue this conversation. And Yomi, I'll let you continue those maybe uh, ancestors that have passed or living elders that have inspired you in the work that you do. Okay, uh, well, I wish that with my dad. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. My dad, my dad started from nothing next to something. So he's a, he's a, he's a very strong model for me. And um, aside that is also, um, I see a lot of um, people, um, they, I have heroes here and there that um, I look up to like um, more, more, those are people who are in social causes. They've made a lot of money and they're just throwing it back into the community to assist here and there. And um, I know that we live in a world where, you know, people are assessed based on their, their, based on their capital wealth, but I think it's the impacts we make in the community where we live or we grow up that, that, that goes a long way for me. So um, for Black, for the Black History Month, um, who, who my, our team, my personal theme has been, uh, is Black wealth and entrepreneurship. And it's part of the program we have in February 25th, you know, um, here at BMO, but I I define wealth as how best do you help other people? It's not about how much is in your TFSA, your RRSP. That's not what matters. It's about the wealth you extend to others that come along with you. How well do you carry people along having that financial education? And I know we're doing a lot um, in the community, especially financial education. And those people who are doing these things are my heroes. Wonderful. And come on, kind of to come back to you, uh, who, in the spirit of Black history, or is he on the phone? Are you here? Nope, okay. I am here. I am here. 
yeah, you're just, so I'm curious, yeah, living or ancestors of past, those that have inspired you in the work that you do. So, it, and it may seem off topic, one of my biggest inspirations in the work that I do, and, and as I look at Black history, is Bob Marley. Um, and everybody be like, what? He's a musician. But as I listen to his music, it's something like part of my self-care as well. I'm stressed, I go, I put it on, and, and you listen to the different songs and the, the social calls that he put into his music that so many people were able to align to. It really yeah. brings people together. And, and the messages that he sent with music are meant to bring people together. And I think that's the work that we're doing in bringing our community together and bringing our community together to collectively step up with other communities, which, which I think is the, 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 the essentials of what he was singing about and sharing and telling the world that, you know, we have to work together. You know, it's one human race, right? And, and if we don't come together, what are we doing? How do we not create an equal platform for one another? You know, and, and just Absolutely. taking those messages and driving forward with them. Yeah, much appreciated. And Susan, curious to hear in the spirit of Black History Month, ancestors past or living elders now, who's inspiring you with the work that you do? Great. Um, a lot of the work that, that I've done, particularly early on in the microfinance, um, was inspired or, or was created for women. And that's because my inspiration um, is around my women elders. So understanding the struggle of those women elders in my life um, has really sort of fueled my passion, right? And the story around that is I didn't always understand the migration journey of Black women and the journey my own mother took at the age of 16 when she left Barbados to travel to England and then to Canada. And that was part of a government program focused on attracting Black women um, in domestic work, right? And, you know, with these programs, these women, they left their children and spouses behind. I don't even know if I could do that today. So, you know, and they had to reinvent themselves. Um, they were juggling to me between these two worlds, the world of their country and where they were at right now. Um, there were oftentimes the sole breadwinner of the family. And um, there were the survival support for so many households. And so for me, and it's sometimes it gets emotional because, you know, these women, like my mom, I've never seen them sad one day, right? They had a lot of resiliency, pride, and hope in what they were doing. And it's those three areas today that I tend to value the most. Um, when we look at the resiliency and the perseverance piece that you know, they had to go through, never given up. They were always pushing forward. Pride um, in their accomplishments. So if they were cleaning houses, looking after someone else's kids, they had pride in their work. And I, that's the same pride that I always want to carry through with what I'm doing. And hope. And so for me, I hope that I can sort of leave a foundation or legacy. And I think that's why I'm always in overdrive um, to do what they've done. They built a foundation. And so for me, I want to be able to, uh, you know, create and leave a better world, better than how I came into it. I think someone mentioned that before. But, you know, these Black moms, aunties, sisters, um, I give them all my respect. I bow down to them because for me, they're the foundation of, you know, where I am at today. Wonderful. And as you mentioned that, one thing that I would like to take some time to do is give you your flowers now while you're here. I have you present because the work that you've done inspired me so much. And not just because of the example that you have uh, put forward, but also because of the willingness to share notes and say, you know what, Ryan, this is some better ways that the organization can in interact with social finance. And the amount of learning that we as a community have gotten from you, Susan, I just want to say thank you because you might not know the ripple effect and the positive effect that you're having on people that might not even talk to you, but that through me and the work that we've been able to do with ACBN and social finance, it 
means a lot and it is, does not go unnoticed. So I just wanted to say thank you before thank we get you. to our last question. Thank you, Ryan. So, and actually I'll, I'll come back to you, Susan. So I'll start with you, Yomi. When we talk about calls to action, from what you're seeing with BMO, what can the Black community do over the next seven days, over the next month? What would be your call to action for the Black community to improve banking while Black? Um, I think it's just, okay. I, I feel like um, awareness is very important also. And then when I'm, what I meant is, um, we there is there is a lot going on um within the ecosystem but the community also need to rise up to what is going on you know we take um we need uh, we need the community to be able to um be proactive about engagement like this we're having a conversation this this networking event um webinars, education. I think while we're, while we're bringing this to the community, we would like to see the community also rise up to it. Because I understand the fact that, um, you know, it's an undes it's been an underserved co um, community. There is a lot of, um, there is a lot of perception going on, but I think everyone is working in good faith, you right, know, right. to and I feel like the community needs to um, be open-minded about how best they can improve, uh, how best we can work together to improve the situation. So in the next 10 days, we're, we're still in the Black History Month. Yes. So much on the world attention is on the Black community right now. And I would just say we need to leverage on it as individuals and as community. So um, we hope to see the, our better lots, you know, improve and um, let us just tap into opportunities that comes that comes our way. Excellent. Much appreciated, Yomi. And Kavan, if you wanted to give your call to action, what can we be doing more purposefully as a community to improve banking while Black? Definitely. Um, I think Yomi hit on some excellent points. Adding to, to what he said, I would say, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for engagement with your banks, your financial institutions, one to, to learn more about the financial system, like working with entrepreneurs, seeing people come in and, you know, they get presented with certain questions and they're like, what, why do we need this? You know, understanding where a lot of that is coming from. I think because we don't know, we, we just don't think about it, right? So expanding that knowledge, taking advantage of opportunities to learn more about the system and, and to give feedback on it, right? Like I, I always say, and I say to Ryan, I say to our other partners, let me know if there's something you think we could change. The, for me in my role, the beauty of things is that I can ask a question. I could go back and I could present an idea. I could say, hey, why don't we do this? I may get told exactly why we can't do it, but I'm gonna ask the question. And I think it should be the same for everybody. Stay curious, stay learning. We have a great opportunity to, to expand the footprint of the community within Canada and across the world. And then we just need to take advantage of it by learning as much as we can and building the relationships that will continue to see us on that path, that path towards financial independence and financial prosperity, right? Like as an entire community. Wonderful. And as we wrap, uh, Susan, again, would love to get your thoughts on the call to action for the community. And don't hold back, because one thing I know, when you put your mind to something and challenge uh, people to get it done, it tends to get done. So I'm curious, how can we improve banking while Black? Yeah, um, I think I have to look at this in two ways. So first, call to action for us as institutions and then to our community because um, there's still a lot of dismantling of barriers that need to happen. I mean, we have to first understand that, you know, this, we expect a lot from the black community, but this is all very new, right? We're talking a year or two that these programs have been created for the community um, and, you know, there's no baseline that has been really been set for this. 
Um, and, and I noticed when these programs first came about, the Black community was like, this is my money. This is for me. And that is an honest, genuine feeling because, you know, the Black community was left out for so many years that, yes, they felt this is my money. I need it. You know, why am I jumping through hoops to get it, right? So I think first is institutions. Um, this is one program. This is one loan product, which is entrepreneurial that we've created, but we may need to dig deeper. Um, we have to look at more customized products and services um, for a community. This is one, but there's housing. There's other investment tools. We, we need to look at the whole spectrum, not just merely as one loan product. We, we've got to do better. And for the community, um, you know, it's around, for me, it's around education. Um, and this is starting to happen in the community. You know, we see a lot of applications and, you know, they may not be complete. They may not be ready, but that is being worked on. I am hopeful because there is, there's organizations like ACBN and BBPA and others that are now part of the ecosystem support. And it's important that we reach out to them. You know, I, I, I go back to, and I say this is new because if you take yourself back to school or get in the job, um, you may not have had those social networks, those social connections that other communities have, which is extremely important. You may not have assets, as, asset to markets. So, you know, you're, you may not have the ability to get the sales the way other communities have. So there's a lot more that I think that needs to be done outside of the Black community in terms of what does the Black community need to do, but what does government institution and others need to do other than providing a loan? Where is the assets to, asset to market so that the business is there? Because we give the loan and I see the entrepreneurs doing their best, but the doors are not opening. You know, there's not everyone who wants to shop at Black businesses. And how do we do that? How do we not have to have others be the face before we can get a loan? And I say that because I have my own son who's an entrepreneur. And when he started his business, he had to hire someone totally different to be the face of that business. So these, to me, these are some other issues and, and barriers that we've got to dismantle, um, you know, before we can ask the community you know, what is it that you're going to do? Wonderful. And I appreciate you sharing the experience of your son, because I'm sure many entrepreneurs, if they didn't physically do it to hire somebody to be the face, they have thought about, hey, maybe I'll get further ahead if somebody else was leading this. But again, we are making progress. I think that's one takeaway as we close out even though it's difficult, we have to lean into the complexity of changing how we uh, engage with the banks. And it takes that engagement. Susan's here, Kavan, Yomi, there are other uh, institutions that have talked about uh, supporting Black entrepreneurs. Make sure we engage so that we can see if they're actually walking the talk. But again, we would like to close as we began as we acknowledge the original stewards of the various lands we are on. We also acknowledge our ancestors. We acknowledge all who have toiled without compassion or co compensation. We acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you again for being present. We really appreciate you and looking forward to seeing you at the next panel discussions in the leadership series this Black History Month. Have a good evening.